Hello and welcome to this week's live stream. As usual, we have Mark Flanagan Hello. and Tom Shannon joining us from Colorado and respectively from London. My name is Louis Cataldi and I am your host. And I'm joining you from uh, Cary, North Carolina, where Epic Games is um, where our home office is. And so today we have a, a live stream that uh, is really a follow up to yesterday's live stream, which we hope that some of you watched. Hope uh, most of you watched, uh, which was an amazing live stream because yesterday we also released a fantastic collection called uh, the Edith Finch, What Remains of Edith Finch collection on the marketplace. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, one of the first of uh, what we expect to be, you know, a number of collections like this, which I believe the marketplace uh, will release and and probably one of the first streams like this that we hope to do uh, where we're going to do, you know, a sort of a deep dive into this content and talk about um, how you might be able to take advantage of this content, how you might be able to dig into it, modify it for your own use, um, and different techniques, you know, that potentially the education community can uh, utilize to take advantage, uh, you know, of, of the generosity of both the development community and releasing this content and also um, just cool ways of, of working with the engine and uh, different techniques from a technical perspective, artistic perspective, and just a general good learning uh, in all the cool stuff you can do with this content. So uh, I'll probably kick it off today. I'm going to start out and uh, we're going to take a look at uh, uh, the packs themselves. We're going to take a look at what's inside of them. Uh, and then we'll actually, I've built a small scene using the content, to look at some of the environmental storytelling. One of the really cool things about uh, the game What Remains of Edith Finch is that there was a tremendous amount of environmental storytelling that went on there. And for those of you who watched the stream yesterday, uh, Brandon, who was the lead artist, and Ian Dallas, who joined the stream, did a really good job about talking about the development of the game. Now, uh, they talked about how this game was made about five years ago in Unreal Engine 4.10. Uh, and, you know, that's 15 versions of the engine ago. So the technology of the engine has evolved a fair amount. So later in the stream, Tom will jump in. Uh, who's a very proficient technical artist, and he will uh, expose, I think, a lot of the new features of the engine, get into some incredibly cool stuff that's coming out uh, mm -hmm. in 4.26. Um, and one of the things that impressed me about this particular game uh, was really the lighting style and the artistic style. Of course, the gameplay was really cool. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do was sort of take version 4.25, uh, show, you know, how you can light a scene in a similar style, maybe not exactly the same, uh, but in a similar style. And then I think Tom's going to go in and light it in a very different style. Uh, we're also going to look at some um, ways that you can take this content, which is fairly stylized in many ways, and maybe make it your own. Because I think that um, what we've, some of the feedback we've received is that, you know, well, this is really amazing content, but how can we take this content? Uh, and use it in our own projects, but modify it significantly enough so that um, it doesn't feel like we're using, you know, the same content that was seen in other games or maybe seen in other projects. Uh, so I think it should be a, a really interesting and fun stream. And um, we are the guests. So that'll be fun. And we get to talk about ourselves. That's exciting, right? Mm, I love talking about me. <laughs> Tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a tech artist. But seriously, uh, yeah, Lewis, this is kind of an interesting stream for us because usually we have on some guests and they show off their stuff. But this time, uh, you know, uh, uh, we we saw that we were getting this these assets and uh, and talked to Victor, and we thought it'd be really interesting if. We took these assets and, and took a look at them kind of from a perspective of both someone using them and someone who's trying to teach Unreal Engine. And what does it mean to have these assets available? What does it mean to your students? What, you know, what, is this something that you should be teaching? Is this even, you know, when I was in school, I, there was, if I had used a Turbo Squid model, I would have got a big fat F. 
you know, that was verboten. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. (laughs) Um, But now we're out here telling everyone to download a bunch of stuff from the marketplace and throw it into their projects. And this is, this is a very different kind of perspective on, on using someone else's work in your work. And I think the world has changed and that sentiment has changed and the ability to take content that is out there already and to use it and repurpose it in meaningful ways is it's essential Mm. because I mean, I bet some people in our audience have played some video games recently and possible. You might've noticed that there's a lot of stuff in those video games now. And um, if you were lucky enough to get a PS4 or or a Xbox, whatever series uh, you probably noticed that there's even more stuff in those games (laughs) and there's just no way to create that amount of content for every single project out there. It would, there's just not enough artists and people and budget and money and time to do that. And so it's things are just going to get more detailed and more complex and everyone's going to expect every corner to be full of detail and geometry and lighting. Mm -hmm. And just like our world is around us, um, you know, just like our world around us, I don't go and cut down the trees and make the wood to build the house. I go and buy some wood and exactly. start from that point. Um, and that's where we're starting to get with a lot of game development. There's a lot of pre-cut wood out there that we can yep. use. Uh, we don't have to go all the way. You know, Back in the day, it was almost like we plant a seedling <laughs> <laughs> in the dirt and we would grow it all the way, cut it down. Make, and, and that's how you'd make a game. You'd build your engine from scratch and every bit of code was yep. produced for that project. Um, and that's something that I think has, there are still games that are still made that way, still AAA productions where everything's bespoke. But I think now it's, it's a very different world. And I think it's, it's use this stuff. Pe- people want more content. They want, richer environments they want um something that is you know visually stimulating i think an awful lot of that is if you have a look at sort of earlier versions of games even games that had environmental storytelling in them and i suppose the the grandfather of them all it would be missed um mm. it was mostly empty there was our, a lot our of brains empty space fill that in, in. Yeah, it's, it's surprising how well our brains fill it in yeah <laughs> Well, we used to imagine things, but now we prefer to actually be shown them. But yeah. the other thing is, when we have all this wonderful content, we have things like mega scans, and we have procedural content, and we have an ability to go out and even do our, our own um, scanning. Uh, what it gives the artist is an ability to be more of an art director rather than somebody who mm. just um, makes polygon objects and bakes and... Um, spends time UV mapping. You know, some of those skills are still really, really valuable, but the fact you can make an entire environment and you can do things really quickly and tell a story using other people's assets is phenomenal. The one thing which I would always say to students is if you are using somebody's work and um, give them attribution. Absolutely. Actually say that that's where it comes from. And the same with concept art, particularly that because a lot of people base their work on concept art. And concept art is where oh, yeah. ideas that's... come from. So just ask the person and say that yeah. they, they contributed. Well, this, this makes me think because tonight, funny enough, is taco night at our house. And Ooh, I know that this doesn't like seem it. like a super relevant point, but, you know, when we have taco night at our house, we don't make the taco shells. You just get the taco shells and they come and... You don't actually have to ground beef. You just get ground beef and you, beans and cheese and all that stuff. We basically are assembling tacos. We're more of a taco assembly house more than a taco making house. <laughs> Over here in the UK, when it's taco night, I go out into the backyard, I, I kill a cow, <laughs> and <laughs> then I've got to you know do it's all the stuff. It, it's yeah, <laughs> that self assembly taco takes a long time to make. <laughs> it does. But some of the cool things and, that. And, 
Go ahead, please. And like, you know, you know, in movies, you know, it's like it's 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 very much becoming very much like every part of our life. You know, if if you're filming a movie and you need to set dress, <laughs> you're not gonna build the dressers well, you might some studios built dressers from scratch. I'm not gonna say every because there's crazy people out there making an animated movie, you're gonna make a little tiny dresser. But typically speaking, you're gonna go to a thrift store or go to Crate and Barrel and by the thing that fits the scene and and very often it won't totally fit the scene you'll they'll paint it or add stuff or chop half of it off or whatever and these are the sorts of things that build the backgrounds of all the movies that you're, that you watch and all of these things so it's very much like video games and, and interactive entertainment are just catching up to yep, right. to the rest of the world to the real world now and it's just becoming more like the real world because it is you know the level of detail and the amount of stuff that's in there is getting closer and closer to a replica world so we have to kind of follow some of those design patterns as well so it's something that you know we we I think we bring it up on this stream probably every time is this idea of reusing content and that this is truly a next gen skill so that's a great when point you're talking about like modeling or all of these things there's next gen but one of the key next gen skills is the ability to source content and reuse content in meaningful ways so that people can't tell that you got that oh that's that same tree that i've seen mm -hmm. a million times but you've got to be able to take that tree and make it fit your project mm -hmm. and and avoid that um, or even know that you know, it's a skill to know, hey, I can go grab these redwoods from this other project mm -hmm. and the human eye will never know the difference between their redwood and my redwood because as long as it's a photorealistic redwood, it's just a tree. No one's memorizing the knot pattern, but that's a skill, you know, the, and it's something that needs to be developed and it's something that students can start developing because again, it's it's a new thing. It's a new change in the way we're doing things. So there's art directors and studios out there that don't know how to do this. They've never practiced it. So it's a, we talk about this a lot with this next stuff for students and everyone. It's just a huge opportunity because if it's new, there are no seasoned veterans. <laughs> so everyone gets to kind of start on a new, on a, a level playing field. So this next gen stuff is such a great opportunity for students and um, you know, this this idea of having this content available and in using it should be looked at as a as a specific skill set and the not other, as a crutch. The other thing which is great with this is actually seeing how top notch professional artists have actually approached some of the the tasks mm -hmm. which they have here. So some of the clever tips and tricks that they've done. Being able to take something apart and see Ah, so that's how they went together. You know, that can be really cool. So, for instance, texture atlases, you know, there's that kind of thing, which the reuse of materials across different objects and the way in which things have been baked. The, you know, the, there's an awful lot you can learn by taking these things apart, apart from using them. But if you want to make your own assets, when you see how really high performance um, objects can be made that look photorealistic, but are minimal in their poly count. Well, what's exciting is that the, the Edith Finch collection is a huge treasure trove of really usable content. There's chairs in here, there's, you know, saws, there's, you know, axes, and then there's cups and plates and, and things that in many cases, you know, there's microwaves, there's record players, there's all kinds of stuff that... Today, we're going to talk about how can we take tools that Epic Games gives away for free and that come with Unreal Engine that you don't even have to, in many cases, go out to DCC tools and um, use those DCC tools to rework this content. In many cases, you can rework it directly inside of Unreal Engine, or you can use a Quixel tool set, the Quixel ecosystem like uh, Mixer uh, and the, the Quixel uh, libraries. Uh, the Megascan libraries to rebuild this content, resurface this content, uh, and make it quite unique. And uh, the form is retained, right? Because uh, though the game was stylized, 
Uh, it was stylized mostly in the approach to surfacing the content, uh, less so in, in the actual shape. And um, and it wasn't dutched and skewed in a way that uh, it is cartoony in nature. And so um, if you think about the amount of content that is actually available, it, it why make more and more chairs if, if something in this content actually fits? And if you go and look once again at the, the marketplace uh, user license agreement, it can be used and it can be used in many, many different projects. Uh, and everyone should go in, download this content. And we're going to take a look at that stuff and, and see how we can do that during the stream. You guys ready to jump in? Yeah. Sure. Yep. All right. Well, let's, let's see what you got. Let's take a look first at the content. Uh, for those folks that haven't had a chance really to dig into it, we're going to take a look at the marketplace. And, you know, once again, if those of you are new to Unreal Engine, this is the Unreal Engine launcher. And there's, of course, an Unreal Engine section to it. And in the uh, Unreal Engine section, there's a marketplace section. And you'll see that, you know, because this is featured uh, Unreal Engine content and a marketplace um, um, pack right now, if you go into the free section, you can actually go to the Epic Games content and you'll see that it is featured here as a marketplace collection. And in the marketplace collection, you'll see that we have 10 packs uh, that are available uh, for the Edith Finch collection. And in many cases, uh, this aligns with many of the different rooms uh, that appear inside of the game or outdoor environments. And you can go and take a look at each one. And what I'll do is I'll start down here, for instance, in the, the house and common areas. This is uh, a beautiful section of the game. And if you do some searching online, there's some really gorgeous screenshots. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can find it. There's a great article that uh, Brandon talked about during the stream yesterday, Have which you can here. find. Yes. Uh, CG Society. CG Society, where he talks about the, the creating yep. uh, of uh, the game and, and a lot of the art style. And this is a gorgeous screenshot that shows this particular area. And you can see the quality of lighting that was achieved and the density in the environmental storytelling. And I was really impressed, you know, by uh, the quality of content that goes on, you know, for a relatively small team uh, building this game. I think the permanent number of artists were, you know, three. And of course, more came on as the, the project went on and they did a tremendous amount of work in here. Uh, but you can see that the environments are just beautifully crafted in many ways. And some of the rooms uh, are really gorgeous and just so much storytelling, you know, popcorn turned over and a roller skate and a roller skate turned over. And, you know, the, just the amount of detail that's going on here, not to mention the lighting uh, for it being Unreal Engine 4.10. So let me go back here. When we go back into the content itself, you can see that you can add this content to an existing project. And the way that I did it is I created a brand new project in Unreal Engine 4.25. And I called it, you know, the Edith Finch Collection. Uh, and I started adding this project and I added all the projects to it. And in there, we'll see in a minute that you can actually look at the content splayed out in an overview map like this. And these are really helpful because it lets you see what's available uh, to look at. And as mentioned earlier, uh, you can see that there's a lot of common things here that you might be able to use right away. You know, a refrigerator, a stove, and these are not overly stylized. So, you know, uh, once again, if you need a refrigerator tomorrow, you might consider taking a look at this and see if it fits into your project, a microwave oven, plates, uh, cutlery, you know, this huge collection of books, you know, so anyone who has to build an environment that has a bookshelf and needs a number of books. And what's kind of nice about a lot of these books is that you can put these in the blueprints uh, and, and create tools that allow you to propagate these books, uh, you know, across multiple different uh, environments. And then you've got some really cool stuff, you know, chandeliers, this big saw, uh, really awesome stuff and some nice chairs and this kind of violin and lamps and all things of that nature. And then you also have an assembled environment. And, you know, there's some 
base level lighting here that was done that approximates the lighting of the game, uh, as well as placement. So you get a sense of context of how this stuff is used in context. And, that, and that's really helpful um, because really understanding how this material is intended to be used makes a big difference. So that's one of the packs. Uh, and let me go back. And I'll go back again. Oh, no, I'll go. What we can do here is take a look at some of the other ones. There's some beautiful rooms. One of my favorite rooms is the twins room. And you can take a look here at that same content. But then this is a really playful environment where there's a tremendous amount of additional storytelling that goes on. And you can sort of see that, uh, you know, it has a very different kind of feel. It's a kid's room. And then the next thing that we get to really look at is how they're implementing master materials. So they're utilizing, you know, good best practices inside of Unreal Engine. Uh, they're utilizing master materials across, you know, a variety of different surfaces. Um, lots of good asset reuse. Uh, the way they're actually doing their curtain materials was really interesting. Uh, and just general good asset placement and workflows. So if I go back and take a look at all the different packs, you've got an outdoor environment, a couple of different outdoor environments that has foliage and trees. And it was a fairly guided experience, uh, the actual game. So, um, you know, you can see how they placed the art assets and the environment assets with regard to the level design. And that's another really important lesson. I'm going to minimize this for a moment. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any comments about uh, that material as we just looked at it on the quick before I open up some of this stuff in general. I mean, this is this goes back to kind of your your point of looking in and seeing how professionals, game developers, uh, create larger projects too. Um, you know, this is a slice out of a, a shipped game. Um, and, you know, we're often question, we get the question, what is the best practices for X, Y, Z? And it's kind of a, a good question because often best practices are, are an art more than a science. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really, I think, informative to look into these sorts of, of systems and see just what they've done and what decisions that they've made. Like I looked into the material folder and uh, the thing that I noticed right away was that there are lots of different master materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so they didn't try and make a single master material that handles all of their types of props. Um, instead, they decided to go for separate materials, one for mast, one for that can do this. And that's it's a choice. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, different studios make different choices. And it was interesting to listen to the stream yesterday, mm -hmm. too, about how this was kind of their first Unreal Engine project. Um, so they were learning Unreal as they were doing this. And of course, they're like, oh my God, I'm kind of embarrassed to put this stuff out there because if I were to do it again today, I'd do right. it completely different. And, and of course, that's something that as you learn in your career, that never stops. Whatever you look back on from five years ago, you're going to be like, I don't care how many awards it won. It's dumb. Um, we just, we learn new things, things move on and we look back and they look not so great. But, and, and the point there is that it's never perfect. No, no production is perfect. And you'll even look in here and you will see, you know, naming things that didn't quite line up. And there's, you know, sometimes it's, it's never exactly everything exactly where you want it. And, and, you know, you know, uh, an example I'll look at later is there's uh, a bunch of tape cassettes and, you know, I could tell that they were like, oh, struggling. Oh, we need to put different labels on each cassette. How do we do it? And I can think of like four different ways off the top of my head and they chose one route and mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, oh, oh, well. And so as an educator too, these are opportunities to look into there and have your students figure this out. Like have them, so say, you know, Tell me why they chose this path. Exactly. Why did they chose, yeah. choose to do 12 different static meshes rather than do it in the material? Could you come up with a more performant way? 
that you come up with a more creative way or a way that looks better, more technical so, way or, you know, something, you know, something that harnesses that new feature of the engine that just came out that they didn't have then the, you know, so there, the opportunities for instruction with this sort of content are, are huge because it does, it gives you a slice into something that exists for better or worse. Uh, and the opportunities are, are really, really good there for, for digging into that and creating those sort of experiences for students and for yourself, if you're a self learner, it's great to be able to go in and go, why did they do that? I wouldn't have done that. Um, and know that this is a shipped game. So yeah. uh, what I always say is what is best practices is whatever shipped your game yeah. at frame rate. Yep. Yeah. And it's on the stores is that it worked its best. Um, oh. whether that was duct tape and bubble gum and, you know, yeah, for sure. frayed rope. Well, one of the things that we that wanted there. to do in the stream is kind of tell you a little bit more about our backgrounds, right? So, uh, you know, I myself, you know, came from a variety of different production backgrounds. I started out in television and did seven years, uh, you know, working as a 3D generalist um, across uh, a variety of different freelance roles, working in commercial television, you know, doing freelance gigs for Nickelodeon and HBO and NBA and, and you know, doing Captain Crunch commercials and doing all that stuff in, in the late 90s and early 2000s before I went to Blue Sky Studios and worked on films like Ice Age and Robots. Uh, as a as a rigor and technical animator, uh, but then I actually moved into the game industry uh, and started a studio with a, a group of guys in New York City called Chaos Studios, and we made uh, two AAA games. One of them was called Frontline's Feel of War, and the second one was called Homefront, the first Homefront game. And one of the the great advantages uh, of you know working in the mid two thousands, you know, into the late two thousands, is that it was still a you know, a very interesting time in game development. Um, and we started with a very small group of guys. When we started Chaos Studios, a Chaos with a K, there were roughly 15, 16 of us that started that studios. And we had to build a team and ship a game uh, within under two years. Uh, and my job was to build an art team to do that. And, you know, we grew an art team to you know, surprising, this game shipped with, I think, an art team of less than six or seven people. You know, we grew an art team to ship Frontline's Fuel of War, the first game, to, I think, about uh, 15 or 16 guys and girls, uh, you know, back then. I think the studio was all together, including QA, back then, less than 70 people all together, which is still, you know, try and make a game that shipped on consoles back in um 2007 a lot right and so considering there was not a huge opportunity to outsource all the qa and all the things that you needed to do back then uh, and that was in unreal engine 3 when unreal engine 3 very first came out and uh, we had to write a lot of our own multiplayer code and a lot of uh features into the engine because we needed to try and take Unreal Engine, which at that time was made for Gears of War 1, which was, you know, for all intents and purposes, a corridor shooter and turn it into an open world type engine, which meant in Frontline's Fuel of War, you could get into a jet, fly a mile and, you know, across a multiplayer level, parachute out, land and run, get in a tank and drive back. Unreal Engine did not want to do that at all. Unreal Engine 3 did not want to do that in any way, shape, or form. The streaming tech was not there. The multiplayer tech was not there, you know. Um, so, you know, the engineering team had to write a lot of that tech into Unreal Engine 3 for Frontline Fuel of War. And then Homefront, uh, Homefront 1, was really a, a lot about the environmental storytelling. And... Um, and so it was a really amazing opportunity to dig into a lot of what they did in this game and, and to look through the game and see just how much environmental storytelling. I loved, you know, working on those titles because um, the team that, uh, you know, I was very passionate about working with, we, we just loved those games because of the opportunity to dig in and tell stories at every turn and, you know, whatever that story happened to be to, to go and tell the story about what was going on in those houses that we made for Homefront, you know, in, in a post uh, occupied America by, you know, at that time we were saying that North Korea attacked 
uh, the United States and that we were living in an occupied United States and, you know, it was post-apocalyptic and it was really kind of cool. So to kind of see a slice of that in a game like this uh, was really, really amazing. And so um, uh, it was really fun to even jump back into the editor and start playing around and doing some environment art too. Uh, but that's my background and, and, um, and I was able to serve as art director for a couple of those games before I went and taught college professionally for five years. And, uh, and that's before joining Epic. And now I've been here for six years. So that's me. I know, Tom, you've made a lot of games. And uh, Mark, you've you've had a huge uh, background at ILM and and, um, and the companies that you've worked in. Yeah. So was, that's who you are, Lewis. <laughs> yes, that's me. We finally understand the man. <laughs> behind the facade yes now i need lots of sleep and medication <laughs> well, I, I, started I feel as, exposed i started as an architect i know yeah tom knows something about that too um but i started as an architect because my parents didn't believe you know when i was still in high school that you know i could make a living doing anything art apart from you know, architecture so i did that then studied um after I became a lead architect, I went back and studied animation, worked in the games industry. About the same time that Lewis was working there, I was working mainly on rally games for um, Codemasters, which was great fun. That was awesome times. And moved to Australia with games, then education, then film, then where I am today. So yeah, um, we've had interesting journeys. But back when I was learning 3D, even one of the first things I learned, I, I still have some of the books. Um, which were from, um, I can't remember the, the guy's first name, but it was Fleming, Bill Fleming, um, which was about actually putting scenes together. It was about that kind of environmental storytelling. And that was one of the things that I, I learned and I thought was really useful, how you actually design scenes. Mm -hmm. The architecture helped with you know, the, the walls, but how you set dress. And I discovered there's actually people who get Academy Awards for set dressing. And I discovered kind of similarly in architecture that I'm not very good at. <laughs> that I should never be an interior designer. Uh, so uh, interestingly, so you started in architecture and went towards games and film. Um, I started in games, so I went to, to school. I wanted to be an animator at Pixar. That was my dream. Um, uh, and while I was in school, I started playing a lot of games and got really kind of more interested in games. And uh, I went, I'm like, all right, well, I want to do games. So I took the one game design class that was taught at my school. I sit in the class and it turns out it's a flash class. Uh, and I'm the only person in the entire 3D department that's taking a games class. Um, so oddly enough, I'm the only one who learned action script during that class as well so um <laughs> this is kind of the start of my tech art career was i got thrown into a games class and had to learn how to program because my teammates uh we've heard this one before so um i graduated and i actually started working in games uh started a small studio in austin around the dot-com bubble time which was pretty easy to do back then, even if you had never actually made a game before. Uh, the dot-com bubble burst, and they took all of our games away uh, <laughs> and all of our money. Those, <laughs> those investors, they're taking up their monies. Um, and kind of at the same time, an engineering firm called me, uh, and they had seen that I did video games, and I had taken a CAD class in high school, and so... They needed me because what they were trying to do is this system called a cave system, mm -hmm. computer aided mm -hmm. visualization environment cave. Ooh. And it's really just, it's a dome or a box with a bunch of projectors and you stand in the middle of it and with motion trackers and these goofy big glasses VR. you can yeah. see in 3d. It was the, you know, and it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to build one of these things. And the only way to project stuff in here was in real time. So they needed someone who could build stuff in real time um, and help build this capability. And so I was like, mm, engineering? Eh. And they were like, steady pay and healthcare. Uh, and I was like, oh, neat. 
Uh, so I ended up working there for almost a decade. Uh, and I ended up working on just some amazing projects. So I got to travel around the world. I worked on the uh, San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. I got to go up in the middle of it as we were building it. Um, the Presidio Parkway, uh, um, uh, stuff in Seattle, Doha. I've, I've lived in Australia, helping build capabilities there and working for mining companies. And so, you know, what started as kind of like, eh, an engineering company, I got to do such amazing things and work on such amazing and like really important projects. Like I feel really, really proud that I worked on, you know, an $8 billion bridge um, that will sit in the Bay of San Francisco for the next hundred years. Um, you know, that's that's pretty darn cool that I, I helped with the biz for that and helped design it and make decisions and all of that. Um, so then, uh, you know, Unreal 4 comes out and uh, I got to uh, be one of the first ones to use Unreal 4. And um, at that point, I just started working for everybody. <laughs> I went back to games. Uh, I worked uh, at 3D Realms, worked on uh, Red Rogers and Bombshell and, you know, some other 3D Realms properties that will never be named again. Uh, <laughs> Mac Tech and worked on some, you know, made some robots explode. Uh, so, and I've done everything from lighting, modeling, visual effects, UIs with UMG, scale form. Um, it's really just been, uh, you know, being a tech artist feeds my ADD so well. Uh, there's just always something else to do and to play with. And, you know, that's, that'll be my kind of demonstration of what we're looking at today is, you know, when Tom gets a pack of really high quality art assets from top artists, what can I do with it? Where can I poke <laughs> at it and throw it in here and try out new stuff? He loves uh, that. I'm, I can I testify. <laughs> I can testify. Give, give me a bank of buttons and watch me push. <laughs> <laughs> and so here I am now, you know, I work uh, with education doing, you know, very, very similar things, finding, finding problems. And, you know, it's my job to push all the buttons in every new version of Unreal and figure out what that means to our community, our educators, and, and what it means to us in Epic as well. So I still have to try and we come up with these amazing things and go, what's the purpose of this? Should we do this? Touch this? What happens if I press that button? What happens if, and it's my job to be like, don't push that button. Don't, <laughs> don't ever push, push that button. I push don't that worry. button. You don't push I that push button. the button for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, And I that's, lost a day of work, so you don't push that button. That's one of the things I used to explain to people I, I did when I was working as a trainer in um, VFX. I would actually make all the mistakes. I would do things that nobody should ever do because then I can tell you, um, don't, don't do, do that. that. Yes. It's what we're here for. We're you, the bow of the ship. You don't want to be a yep. trainer in a stuntman uh, company. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> Well, let's Someone jump into the let's jump into the content a little bit more. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, what I did, uh, as I mentioned to you all, is that I migrated or I, I downloaded all these projects into you know a four point two five project like this, and so you can now sort of see that many of them are are together. And one of the advantages I think of doing something like this, uh, if you haven't run across you know, a collection like this is that you can then migrate this content or even entire maps uh, out into uh, a, a working project. So if some of you aren't certain how to workflow something like that, uh, this is something that you can consider yourself. So once again, this is the overview map. And just be aware that as you open this content up, you may have some shader caching that will occur. Uh, I think I've cached a couple of these, pre a couple of these, so it shouldn't be so bad. I want to make sure that I'm opening the correct ones. No, actually, it wasn't grounds. It was first floor. So we'll wait for this to open up. And uh, you'll find in most of these that there's the overview map, which is the map that is uh, sort of all laid out. Uh, with all the assets side by side and the marketplace team at Epic does an amazing job of taking all the content and uh, sort of opening it up like this so that you can see what is uh, available 
to everyone. Uh, and that makes a really nice difference. And then there's the example map. And the example map is uh, the assets placed in context. And um, once again, that can be really helpful because when you get an overview map and you're like, well, you know, here's all this stuff. How is it intended to be used or how did the original developers use it? It can be really helpful to look at a contextual example of how, uh, in this case, um, Brandon and the team actually used it to tell environmental stories. So isn't that exciting that I pushed the wrong one? It's still pretty cool. While we're here, let's just take a look at this one. This is um, just some of the content. And you can see that, the, you know, there's some really nice stuff here. This, you know, who doesn't need a plank of wood like this or, or a, a tree stump that you can munge into the ground? Uh, super hard art asset to actually generate is a, a tarp like this. Uh, fortunately, Unreal Engine is delightfully physically based, so making plastic is uh, a little easier than it can be in, than it was in the old days. A nice um, water tank or oil tank. Great bicycle. I actually like this bicycle a lot. And a lawnmower. Like, this is how really useful a lot of this content is. And then some other really great stuff. A canoe. Are, are you kidding me? Uh, who doesn't need a canoe? And then some great natural ass, uh, assets here. And then, of course, a dragon head slide thing. How perfect uh, is it to have a dragon head? And then let me open up one of the contextual maps. And this is the sort of kitchen uh, with the dining room attached. And you can see that this is really helpful to sort of see if I push the G key on my keyboard here and get a, a little wider view. You can see the, the use of this content and some of the environmental storytelling that's going on here. And once again, the Marketplace team works with uh, the actual developers to help assemble these. It's not exactly the map that uh, is in the game, uh, but once again, the idea is to be able to share as much of this content as it was shipped in the original game. And once again, if you select the assets, you will get the uh, reference to the mesh as well as the reference to the material instance or the master material. And I can click on the material and you can see that it's using a material instance here. Uh, and you can see how they're using their material instance. It will dig into this a little bit more uh, to put in their base texture, normal map and roughness map. Uh, and this material, master material, is used throughout the entire game. And once again, this was made back in 410. So uh, uh, Brandon talks about this quite a bit during the stream about uh, the reuse of this content. And and I think that they created a couple of tools uh, inside of uh, Unreal Engine to help them during the production process. But for the most part, they used a fairly vanilla Unreal Engine 4.10 for the development of the game. Uh, some of the techniques that I thought were really interesting, for instance, is when they built these curtains, uh, the lighting techniques that were really used were to take spotlights and place spotlights outside. And if I hit the G key, they would put a couple spotlights outside and they would stream light into the windows. But trying to get this kind of window frame popping through and translucency in a material can be really challenging. So if we take a look, for instance, at the curtains and we look at the material by double clicking on the material sphere, you can see that there's an actually an emissive material that has that shape attached to it. Uh, so there are some things that you really want to do on purpose and you really want to try and get lighting to facilitate. But then there are other things that you just, if you can put a emissive material and approximate that, and by all means, uh, you make life easier and you don't always try and make everything perfect and correct. That's not the way I did it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I come from, uh, you know, an architectural sort of background like Mark does. And so um, learning these more artistic ways of lighting has been really interesting for me. I spent my career kind of trying to simulate realistic lighting as much as possible. And so adding in extra lights or using spotlights and you should be using a directional were kind of no-nos because 
then the lighting that we're showing is not accurate. It's not something feasible that could happen in the real world. Um, cause it, with our, with visualization, engineering, whatever, you don't want to lie to the audience. You can't, can't make things up. Um, you can make it look really pretty and glowy and, uh, perfect, but it can't, it can't be unrealistic. It can't be, you know, someone can't go and buy a $4 million condo based on what you're saying. And then they get there and it's the light will never come in through that window the way that it did in the render. That's not going to go over. Um, so, you know, I've, I've really, you know, through the years working in games and working with content, I love being able to look at how lighting artists approach this non-realistic sort of lighting setup because it's so, so very foreign to me to, to do these things that are not correct, so to speak. Sometimes it's not necessarily what's correct, but it's what you expect. Mm. that's mm. one of the things that people mm. do an awful lot because you would expect to see some of these things. You may not actually see them in the real world, but if you see it in a game, you just say, oh, yeah, that, that's right. Um, another thing is being able to to cheat these things is incredibly powerful. One example I, I come back to frequently is in Surf's Up, the movie, um, the waves, the sort of barrel waves. Um, looked at that the first time. How did they manage to get such wonderful subsurface scattering in those waves and how do they get the, the light to come through them so well they didn't they painted them they painted the inside <laughs> of those and it looked stunning mm -hmm. they, they tried to simulate it and it just it it wasn't producing exactly the right results every time so much better to to make it right yeah absolutely uh m m9 havoc actually points out too that uh brandon had and had mentioned yesterday in the stream that in 410 Light uh, light portals didn't actually exist in Unreal Engine 4.10, but they came out in Unreal Engine 4.11. Uh, now, light mass portals are really powerful, and I'm going to show you in a minute that I use them in the scene that I built. Uh, and what light mass portals actually do is that they funnel uh, illumination from an outdoor area in through an opening uh, into an indoor area and help fill out the space as light mass does its uh, pre-computed calculation. And so it, it can actually help get light into the corners and, and, uh, and do, you know, nice, uh, pre-computed, uh, global illumination bakes and, um, and shadow bakes in there. And I think that probably as that development team saw that tech roll out in some of the, the videos. And I, I remember that, um, Daniel Wright and a couple of the guys did some inside Unreal streams talking about light mass portals and and the the power of them back in the four nine four ten days, and everyone was like, "Oh, I need light mass portals," <laughs> because before then, I, I, Tom, you probably remember this. Before then, you had to go into any files and tweak any files in order to cheat the world scale uh, to get light mass to okay. do all kinds of crazy stuff, and so. Light mass portals were really, really helpful. And there's some great papers. If those of you are interested in, in uh, light mass rendering, if you do some Google searches, there are some really powerful papers uh, and presentations that are available. Uh, some done by, I don't remember. It was, uh, uh, I think, from Epic Games Japan. Um, and I don't remember his name. Uh, or it was Epic Games China. I don't remember. It did a huge deep dive in the light mass, and and there's a, a brilliant thing I think on LinkedIn, uh, where all the values are exposed and shows all these images of you know how you tune and tweak these uh, values in the light mass portal. So uh, that's really really great learning. Um, let me share one more thing in this content before I jump in. If you are digging through this and you're like, wow, I'd really like to use this or, or, and you don't feel particular, let's say you're working on a project uh, and you find a piece of content in here and you don't necessarily want to download the entire project into your working project. Uh, you can always select a specific asset. You can hit control B on your keyboard to find it in your content browser, or you can right click and say browse to asset will do exactly the same thing. And then when you find it and you know, you can use the control key and zoom in on it and then, you know, hit control B, you'll find it again here. Let's say you want this refrigerator. 
you can select it and right click on it and then you can do an asset actions migrate and migrate will actually find all the associated assets uh, with it whether it's textures materials uh, material functions master materials material instances whatever they might be and I think this functionality came in, uh, do you remember Tom or Mark it was in 421? Migrate? Or 4, no, the, the actual checkbox. Uh, in, the, in 21 or 22, you could actually, mm. before that, you couldn't actually deselect some of these bits. Right. But in 421 or 22, you can actually say, well, you know, I don't actually want the material or I don't want these textures. I just want the mesh or whatever the case is. Uh, so now you can actually deselect some of the things you don't want or, you know, make sure that you include or not include some of the elements that you may want. And then you click OK and then you say, well, where do you want to put it? Uh, and then you actually have to point it to your content browser of your, your ingesting project, the project you want to ingest the content into. Uh, and that's how you can very easily take some of this very specific content into a project. Uh, anything that you would add to uh, to looking at this content for either of you guys before we move into the next section? Um, I think uh, it, I, I've always kind of struggled when I'm using marketplace packs and I'm merging them all into one thing, one project. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be helpful to do a little pre-organization of the marketplace pack. Uh, so, and I'll show, I can show you this uh, here in a moment. Um, I imported some stuff into my scene. I didn't end up using it, but they were from some other marketplace packs. And, and um, what happens is that you'll end up with kind of a similar folder structure in both. So if you have, you know, a blueprints folder in your root um, and a materials folder in the root and textures, and you have two projects so you'll end up putting all your materials into that one folder and all your textures, which can be fine, but sometimes you'll get textures or whatever that are named the same and they can override each other. Um, and so sometimes what I'll do is I'll take my marketplace content um, and I will go and before I migrate it, I'll go and put it into a folder. Um, and a lot of marketplace content will actually come this way. So when you download it, it'll come in its own folder. Mm -hmm. um, other marketplace content doesn't. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this is something that is uh, something you have to consider when you're using third party content is everyone has a different idea of what best practices are, like I said before. So uh, some projects, they'll have very neat and orderly uh, setups. And so what I'm saying is, oftentimes, it's a lot easier to do the organization and renaming and doing everything in not in your giant project with tons of content that's mission critical that you could break i do it before i migrate it so if i'm going to have to rename it and put it into a folder structure that i like i'm going to do that in a safe place in my safe place which is that you know that project that i just downloaded and if i break it i can just re-download it um, i feel that's much great. less anxiety great tip. So, and also if it works there and I migrated over. I know that my new my my project that I'm going to be working on for weeks, months, or years isn't isn't going to immediately just be or full sullied, of like right. a bunch of extra folders. Yeah, and it, great tip. It becomes really hard to to do that. So just yeah. be really aware. And like Lewis said, often you don't want to take everything. Right. Take what you need. Spend the time in that project. I'll even go and set up one of these little maps. In a project, and just put the yeah. assets that I want, mm -hmm. and then you can migrate that that view map, map file, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll take all those assets with. Great it. tip. So yep. Those are those are some of the things that I look at when I'm when I'm mashing these. Yeah, these deleting things, things in Unreal Engine can be no fun. It's completely possible, but it can be no fun because you get these warning boxes that have big red buttons, and you're like, I don't want to push that button. I <laughs> <laughs> Anything I can do to avoid renaming, fixing up redirectors in my project. So yeah, do all that in their project. Mess right. up your. Yeah, because you can always re-download it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah great tip. Yes. Great tip. Be safe. Be safe out there, everybody. Yes. All right. So um, 
I'm going to jump into another project real quick. Uh, that's that. So let me pull this one over here and get it out of the way. And I'm going to open up. So what I did here is I brought a bunch of stuff over and uh, did a little environmental storytelling of my own uh, and just some lighting and kind of borrowed some other assets from some uh, other epic maps. And my goal in this, as we started preparing the stream was, you know, how can I do some environmental storytelling? And, um, and as we were discussing it, it was like, well, you know, everyone's seen the realistic rendering room inside of uh, our launcher, uh, which is one of the things in our learn tab. How can I sort of take the theme of our realistic rendering room, bring in a bunch of the assets and do environmental tor storytelling inside of here with a variety of these assets and kind of try and approximate um, some of the lighting with uh, the newer features of 4.25 and, you know, not take it quite as far as Tom's going to take it because he did a similar exercise, but he's going to sort of take it to the next level even uh, to this. And so uh, this is more of an exercise, once again, in environmental storytelling. How can you take many of these assets that were used for completely different uh, rooms in many cases and, and you know tell these stories you know of somebody who's maybe doing some studying who's eaten some food and left all this stuff over there who's uh, you know crashing on the couch and left his laptop you know playing his guitar over here and you know does a lot of stuff with their their books and so forth and has got their bike uh, stuffed in the corner and um, has their record player and VCR and stuff like that. So, uh, and then once again, one of the things that I really liked about uh, what remains of Edith Finch was the lighting style and uh, you know the streaming light through the windows and the the hint of illumination coming through from the outside world and the deep shadows that uh, you saw and the deep ambient occlusion. So. Um, Listening to Brandon yesterday, it seemed like they iterated on that lighting quite a bit, and it would take quite a while to um, to render that lighting as they were doing their light bakes. Um, and in many ways, I think Unreal Engine has gotten a lot faster. And, and listening to Brandon yesterday, he's like, well, you know, I sure do wish I had a lot of the tools that are available in Unreal Engine now. Um but what's kind of interesting is that Unreal has gotten more and more physically based. And in some ways, it can be a little bit more challenging to, to light a scene, you know, in a more stylized way with something that constantly wants to be more physically based, right? And so if you're trying to get a very stylized look and the engine is constantly leaning towards um, something that is more stylized, you know, then you're going to have to do some other things. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to do really quickly is show you how you can do something like this, you know, fairly quickly uh, using some of the techniques that they use, uh, that Brandon talked about using, uh, and and then using some of the modern, I guess modern, maybe not the right way, they use spotlights, but, you know, you can certainly use now what we have, which is these uh, rec lights. Uh, that are available uh, that came in, I think, probably, I don't know, two or three in versions of the engine ago. And then using, you know, post-processing and things like that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just open up something with no lights and just give it a quick whirl. And we'll kind of cooking show it a little bit and show you how I go about doing some of this illumination. Uh, and I think Tom's going to go about and do it the same way. And, you know, maybe there's some really great lighters in the stream who will be like, I would never do it that way. And maybe some of you will learn something and, and everyone will be happy. And one of the very first things that I do is what you'll see here is I'll go into unlit mode. And you can see that currently there are no lights in the scene. And I've got a lights folder, but I've basically gone through and gotten rid of all the lights. and. Um, one of the very first things that I do is I make sure that I nuke exposure in the scene because what I don't want to do is fight the exposure uh, of the engine. So as I'm in an indoor dark space, I don't want to go anywhere that is really dark and have 
the exposure equalize uh, for the space. And you can do that directly in your viewport. So you can go in, go to the lighting drop down. Uh, typically it says lit. Of course, it'll be really dark. And what's coming in through uh, right now is actually uh, the fact that the curtains have some light maps still baked on them uh, when I nuke the light. So I can go to game settings and untick the game settings box. And that's typically set to EV100, but if you set it to a negative one and go back to lit mode, well, actually nothing's gonna happen right now, but what I've done effectively is nuked uh, the exposure settings. And now I can start dragging some lights into the scene. So one of the things that Brandon talked about, and actually I'm gonna get rid of my reflection actor, my skylight, and that reflection actor as well talked about using these point lights uh, in the world and using them at a really low value. And the other thing they talked about when using these kinds of point lights, and they used them, I think, um, probably to approximate um, ambient light in the scene. Uh, and you can completely still use this in complement with a skylight, which is a typical uh, light that you use for ambient light. But one of the nice things that you'll notice as you watch videos of the game or play the game is that there's a really delightful ambient fill in the scene. So uh, this is still completely a viable workflow. Uh, but if you use this, uh, they're using them and they're turning actual shadows off. So you get just a pure ambient fill from this. And we're calculating shadows from something else. And so instead of having an intensity set all the way to default of eight, uh, I might tune that down to something like one. So it gives you a much lower ambient fill. And I might actually turn the uh, uh, softness up on this uh, so that it becomes a much softer. So actually give it a softness of five and, and I can even jack that up and you'll actually see uh, that as you turn it up, you will get a, a source radius and then a soft source radius, which will give you much softer illumination from that. So I might give that a value of something like 50 and maybe something of like 100 and see how that goes with my soft illumination. Now, another thing that you can use uh, quite uh, nicely in environments like this is color temperature. And I used it in my original scene. And since We've got warm light coming in here in the foreground. I can knock this down to like 3,500 and that'll warm up the room. Maybe that's too low, maybe 4,500. And that'll give me just a little warm glow from this light. And one thing that I'm gonna do is not use it as a stationary, but as a static light uh, so that uh, it will bake as a pre-computed light entirely. And once I have some general settings in here, I'm gonna do preview render so I can go back uh, and, multi and alter it, but I'm going to use the Alt key and duplicate it in the scene to get a little bit more fill from it. And then I'm going to duplicate it one more time back into the corner and even tune it down a little bit further. Maybe to even lower like 0.15, so it's really low. Maybe turn my attenuation radius up a little bit higher. What's that one set to? 100, maybe 500. And maybe make this one just a touch cooler, but instead of changing the light, once again, I'll use color temperature and I'll set it to default and jack it up to 75, 7,500. And now when it comes to actually getting some light coming in through the outside, once again, I will go into my lighting tab and I'll use a rec light and drag it outside here and rotate it into place. And this one, I think I used a pretty powerful setting. Check my notes here. I think this one I had up to about 30. And this one I kept as a stationary light and I turn my attenuation radius up pretty high on this so that it really filled the space and I made it pretty big, 400 wide 
and something like 250 tall and made sure that it was nice and square and moved it into place and make sure that it's facing in the right direction. 90 is not correct, but negative 90, I think that's right. And it starts to bring in some illumination into the scene. A little bit here and there. Actually, I think it is 90. That's the wrong way. There we go. Now it's bringing some light into the scene. Cool, cool. Now this one will cast shadows and it will use color temperature. And I think I had it set to, once again, something fairly warm. 3,500. And the other thing that I actually did with this light is one challenge that I have in this space is that I've got this uh, frame here. And so this light will actually get occluded as I bake it. But as a stationary light, I can actually set it, the light channels on it. And so if I set the light channels uh, to... Let me select the light again. One thing also that I do just so that everyone's aware is I take all my lights so that they're easier to select and find and I right click and I move them into a lighting folder. So let me go out here again and select this light and move it into a lighting folder. And with it selected, if you go into the advanced, I think I keep it in there, but you'll see that the actual uh, sliding doors are set to be on a different channel so that that light can actually pass through it and hit the curtains. And then I'm going to take that light again and dupe it and bring it inside because I'm not going to get all the illumination I need from it and tilt it down and make it much smaller. So let me see what I used for this one. Now this one's nowhere near the same power. Set to something like 12. Attenuation radius is much smaller so that it doesn't influence the entire room. And I made it like 60 wide and 140. I think that's backwards. It's like 140 this way and 60 this way. So what I'm trying to do is sort of get that heat coming in right in front of the scene there. And messed around a little bit with the barn door angle so that I didn't get a hard shadow on that wall and move it out of the way a little bit. Once again, what I need from this is to cast some good shadows here and give me some heat on the table. Like Mark was saying, you know, sometimes you get purely physically based and sometimes you cheat a little bit and get what you need. And so at this point, I can go into my world settings and you can see that uh, when manipulating light mass here, we're actually taking the static light levels and it typically defaults to one. So I actually want to push my rays in a little bit closer. We're going to use ambient occlusion uh, and we're going to go in and set the volumetric detail cell size uh, from 200 down to 60. And we'll change maximum occlusion distance. And I played with these values a little bit. Tom uh, uh, rec made some recommendations, and I've just been messing around with them. So 0. 0.6, and the exponent value, I jacked it up. So now I can do a very preliminary light bake. I set the quality to preview and just sort of see what I get. So one of the nice things and one of the things that I like to sort of try and do very quickly is get as 
as the quickest light bakes that I can get out of the system. Uh, so you can see that, you know, by not overtaxing the system, uh, I can actually get, you know, a fairly quick light bake. So um, doing preview uh, bakes as much as possible and trying to understand what uh, it will give me before, you know, committing to uh, an actual light bake that, um, that would be anywhere final. Now, while that's doing that, uh, I can certainly go in and start teeing up things like a post-process volume because the final scene had, um, I had corrected my um, aperture settings in the post-process uh, and start manipulating the aperture values in the post-process because I want these deep shadows in the scene. And you can start to see I'm getting sort of that ambient. I hit the G key to see what that ambient looks like. And you can see that right away I'm getting that ambient fill. Now I can pull more light into the scene uh, and I can do a couple things even to speed up my, my bakes. Uh, one thing that's really important when you're doing pre-computed lighting is to come in here and put in a light mass importance volume. So I can come out into the scene here and I can do, uh, actually before I put that in, since I can't see anything, I'm going to go into the visual effects and put in a sky atmosphere. And we have a uh, actually, I'm going to use an atmospheric fog out here because it's going to be much easier to see it. And um, I'm not actually going to be outdoors, so I'm not going to be able to take full advantage of uh, the nice new sky atmosphere system in this case. So I'm going to use just the atmospheric fog uh, that will give me at least this outdoor tone. Uh, and this is going to help pull light into the scene. But I'm also going to bring in, and I'll, I'll bring that in in a moment. I want to do this fairly quickly. Uh, and I'm also going to bring in my light mass importance volume. And now that I can see it, I can set a light mass importance volume. Now, light mass importance volume is important. <clears throat> Let's see. Did I, there, there it is. Where is it going? Light mass importance volume. There we go. Oh, are you I put in game mode. No, yes, I actually brought in a light character indirected detail volume instead. So now I'm going to zero it out, and I'm going to make my entire space encompassed within the light mass importance volume. And this actually is going to focus all of my light mass renders into this particular space, and this helps a fair amount as you're doing your calculation. So now that I know roughly what size I am going to be, I'll punch in these values a little bit more cleanly. And what it's doing is it's telling light mass, yes, don't go all the way out and cast rays into the infinite, you know, uh, distance, but instead focus your light mass calculation inside of this volume space. And then with those two things in place, what I want to do is take my light mass portal and go ahead and drop it right in front of this window and rotate it and scale it up so that it covers that window and tells illumination to get sucked in from all this nice outside illumination into the space. And I might do another render here, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and add a couple more elements. So the very f next element I want is to actually bring in, surprisingly enough, a height fog. But one of the things that, as I look through more of the screenshots uh, that you see uh, from the Edith Finch game, there's just this ambient and, and depth in the game. And so, you can see right away as I bring in the height fog that you start to get a little bit more ambient depth. And this was probably not available to them, but you can actually turn on volumetric fog inside of the scene. And you can start to bring in the extinction scale to say a value of three. 
and the light scattering intensity to a value of something like three. And you can start to see that the fog will start to populate the scene a little bit more intensely. And you can now manipulate things like the albedo value if you want. Now you have to be a little bit careful because your point lights are going to be distributed by it. So you don't want to overdo it. But it will start to help fill in some of the values in there with the volumetric lighting. Of course, you can manipulate the fog density. But once again, um, you may want to go into these point lights and play with this indirect lighting intensity and, and change some of these values as well. So let's see what I set that to and give it uh, another quick bake. See where we are, and I'm going to move on here in a minute. But just basically, what I wanted to show, I'm going to drop in a post-process volumes and show you one of the some of those settings. Then we'll go back to the the finished scene, and you can see how quickly you can sort of do some of this type of lighting. And this this type of lighting is kind of how I learn lighting, which is the additive style of lighting. Um, I always I always try and have as few lights as possible for better or worse. Cause you know, I see some lighting artists and they've got like 60 lights crammed in a corner. Why? Uh, but yeah, this, this like additive way of taking the scene and just adding light where it needs to be, um, is, is really key. You know, I, when I've worked, Often I'll just be like, oh, well, I'm going to put a light over in the lamp, a light over here, a light where all the soffits are, and lights everywhere. And then I bake lighting. It takes forever. Everything's washed out. And I don't really even know where to start. Um, so it's really key to, to teach and to, to learn how to, to take your time with lighting <laughs> uh, and then take the time to put in the light, see how that light reacts to your scene. And I just always have to remind myself that before I would put a light into V-Ray and I would have to wait maybe an hour <laughs> to see what it looked like. So, uh, you know, sometimes I get a little caught up <laughs> in real time and forget that, oh, waiting three minutes to see a fully GI scene, uh, not so bad. Uh, and then and then we'll see, you know, there's some stuff on the horizon here that, that'll make even you know, this waiting process a little easier to. I'm going to go. The other thing which I would sometimes yeah. do is a soloing a light, just so you can see what the yes. effect of a, an individual light is, because once you add more than five, six, seven, eight lights into your scene and you put another light in, it's hard to tell exactly what it's affecting or which lights are overlapping and doing what in the, in the scene. So it can be really useful to solo individual lights at times to be more mm. effective with Absolutely. their use. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to show you guys really quickly that what I went and did in the lighting section is I returned on these game settings, which turned on my exposure again. And you can see what it does. Here's with exposure turned off in the viewport. And then when I turn exposure back on, you can see how it just kind of says, wow, you're in a really dark space. Let me uh, equalize and in essence dilate your pupils. Uh, and this becomes very difficult to light the scene. So you definitely want to nuke your exposure as you're doing lighting. And another way to do it now that I've dropped in a post-process volume is first of all, to go in and turn on infinite extent. And so that means that you no longer have to be inside the post-process volume in order for it to work. It covers the entire scene. And then I can go up to the actual exposure settings and I can take both the min and the max and set them to the same value. So in this case, I'm gonna set it to four and I'm gonna set it to four. So if you don't want to, to you know, have your exposure dialing up and down, and then I can take my exposure, exposure compensation up above and set it to something like 4.5 or maybe five. And I did turn it up, let's see. Did I turn it back on? No, turn it back on, there we go. So now we can see that I have now full exposure control right here in my post-process volume. So I can set it up to five here. And if I want to control the general illumination of my scene, I can do it through my exposure settings. Uh, but I can also, uh, like I did in the other scene, 
start manipulating some of these color grading values. So I can go in and jack in the contrast settings for my shadows. So I can say 1.5 will give me some deeper shadows. Maybe that's a little too harsh. 1.2. I can go in and actually in the, the global settings, boost my gain a little bit as, as well. You know, so that's going to give me a little bit of boost as well in my gain. Uh, I can go in there and uh, boost my contrast a little bit. And so this is, you know, just some really quick and interesting ways to pump up, you know, the, the shadow contrast that you're getting from your pre-computed uh, ambient occlusion settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, uh, you know, I really struggled. I was with my scene at the beginning because I was trying to force all the lights and everything to match that saturated rich look that I, that I had and uh, they just weren't getting there. And um, it's because they're physically accurate <laughs> and lights in the real yeah. world. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you go out and, and you take a photograph of a movie set, it's going to look kind of like it does in your viewport just by scratch. So, you know, when you're working in lighting and unreal, just think of it like that. You're working in, you know, by default in a completely uncolor corrected space. Uh, and, and almost never have you ever watched a TV show or a movie and you've seen just a raw uncolor corrected bit of footage. And when you have, you're probably like, wow, that looks kind of garbagey and amateur-y. You know, when you see the behind the scenes stuff of even the Avengers, the raw footage is low contrast. It doesn't right. have that... You know, right. they didn't shoot the Matrix under a bunch of green lights. They shot them under regular lights and then made everyone green later. Um, and that's something that in CG, you have all this control and you can make lights bright red and blue and whatever. Um, but they don't, to get them to have that look that's in your head often, you just have to make them just stupidly colored. And they don't look good. And trying to find that balance is near impossible. So just remember that there is this last stage. and when you're lighting your lights and coming up with that feel is that you're just trying to get a foot in there. And then your post process is what's going to take whatever you've done yep. and, and pump it up and make it, it's going to take your shadows and make them a little darker. It's going to make your colors, make them more saturated. That's your time to do that. So don't struggle with your lighting. Like I did <laughs> trying to get it orange, get it warmer than the yes. other lights where I'm like, this light is warm. These lights are cool. And then in post I could really bring in and really control that. And I didn't have to wait for rendering or anything. It's instant. And I was really able to dial in that look that I had in my head a lot easier than battling with the lights. Um, lights and color in particular are a huge topic within um, CG in, um, in film production. Um, color scientists are, at a premium and mm -hmm. understanding a little bit about color science is great. If you ever get involved with a, a color scientist in a conversation, you may need to run, run away because it'll probably go on for about five <laughs> hours, but it's fascinating. Um, it is fascinating, but there's all kinds of things like ACES CG and lookup tables and all these other things that if you have a little bit of understanding of them, you can finesse the look of your final scene dramatically, really, really quickly. I'm sure coming from ILM and DNEG, those are serious training topics. Oh, yeah. Yep. I still have dreams about them. Well, let me talk about <laughs> the last couple of things I did here. Uh, so you definitely want to go in and place your reflection capture actors in the scene to get things to pop. Um, and um, reflection capture actors, if you want to actually, you know, enhance the scene to the next level, you can go ahead and put uh, a skylight in the scene and then boost at low levels, the ambient fill a little bit more so you can get back into these back corners. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and open up the finished version of the scene again. I don't need to save it because, and you can sort of see how all those things sort of come together to get to know something a little bit more completed and I, when you get it all together it gives you a little bit more of the, the stuff cool hopefully that was you know helpful informative you can see that you can fairly quickly uh, use the set dressing to do some environmental storytelling and if you are in, in, on the learning side 
Uh, this stuff can be really valuable. You know, you can give credit to uh, the Edith Finch team and say, I didn't make this stuff, but here's what skills I am applying to the table. You know, it could be the lighting skills, could be the environmental storytelling skills, could be the technical art skills. Uh, and then, you know, you could even be cute. Uh, if I push simulate, you can see that you can make a little silly blueprint that makes the fan turn. So um, we'll get much more technical than that here in a moment. Um, before I turn the stream over to him, though, I do want to show you one other thing that I think is really, really important. If you want to modify these assets uh, and make them much more your own, uh, you can take uh, any piece of content. So if I go in here and filter for static meshes and look for chair, uh, you can see that there are these chairs, right? So uh, this is the original chair. And so I'll put it into the scene. Of course, it's going to break all the lighting. No big deal. And so this is the original chair in the scene. And what I did is I went and retextured it. And so this is the retextured chair. And so this isn't especially the most ideal lighting, but if you can take a look at this chair and look at the material and I play around with their material. I can scale down the roughness a little bit to address the lighting in the scene. And you can see that, you know, this is a very different chair all of a sudden. And it's got some nice wood on the legs, it's got some cool worn leather. And in many cases, it matches more closely to the chair that's sitting next to it. So the question is, is how do you do that once again? quickly and easily uh, and take that chair, which, you know, I might not use in this particular scene and make it into this chair, which I certainly might use in a scene like this. Uh, so let's look at that really quickly. And for that, we're going to bring over our friend, Quixel Mixer. So Quixel Mixer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you have something to say? I said, woo. <laughs> woo. <laughs> So Quixel Mixer... I say that every time I open up a <laughs> Quixel product, quite honestly. Is, uh, once again, completely free to anyone with an Epic ID uh, that, uh, you know, uses Unreal Engine or plays Fortnite or, or has made an Epic ID. And uh, Quixel Mixer, um, I guess up until the beginning of this year, was mostly used for two-dimensional surfaces. So I can use the Alt key and pan around, and you can see that you've got a plane here. Uh, but actually, if you go into the setup, you can actually import and bring in a 3D model in here and start working with it. So one of the things that I did is I took the chair and I said, right click, asset actions, export, and you get the opportunity here to export it as an FPX file. Now what I did is I took this file into um, Maya, but you can take it into Max and you can take it into Blender and you can assign material IDs to the different surfaces. So you can see here that basically I've got a wood surface and I've got the back, which is a leather, you know, or what I wanted to make into a leather surface. And so I wanted to put material, separate material IDs so that I can separate them inside of Mixer here. Uh, so now what I can do is come into the model settings and I can say, bring in a custom mesh. And so I can go to wherever I put this stuff. Let's see, where did I put the stuff? There they are. And I can bring in, which one is it? I think it's this one. No, actually, it's not either of these. It is, oh my goodness, where is it? It's called... FBX, wherever that happens to be. Bear with me a moment. See, here we go. I think it's that one. And so I bring in the chair into Mixer here. And then one of the things that I can do is to go back into the layers section here, and you can see that there's in the base layer, this material ID slot. So I can actually go in and load a material ID 
for the chair, which you export. You can export it from Maya uh, if you assign the surfaces and bake it down to the UVs. And it instantly brings in a map that I can assign for the different material IDs. Now, we could spend the next hour or so talking about how to make material IDs and how to, you know, really in depth get into Quixel Mixer. Uh, but we don't really have that because I don't want to take any time away from the cool stuff that Tom's going to show you. Uh, so I'm going to show you the super fast and dirty way to do this, uh, which is we've got our base layer, which is the chair. I'm going to create a new layer here. And what I'm going to do is to go into my local library and I'm going to go into my smart material section. And the smart material section are really, really powerful. And uh, I encourage you all to go and look and download the smart materials from the Quixel Mixer Mega Scan section because there's a ton of really gold stuff in here. And one of them is called Leather. And I think there's one called Purse. Let me see where it is. There's one that I found that was called purse leather, mm, but maybe it's called something else. Let me find it. Is that it? That's old clay. Uh, 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 uh. I recently mixed my libraries and I don't know that they all came over perfectly. So if I don't find it, I will just use something else and make it work. Mm -mm. But when you install Mixer, you can bring in all kinds of other libraries. I'm going to use seem to have nuked my leather. I'm going to use something else. I'm going to use dirty ceramic pot and just make it work. So you can see when you bring in something like this, it applies it to the entire surface. <clears throat> so one thing that you can do is select the actual smart material. Now what a smart material is, is actually a group of sub layer. So I've got my base layer and I can go into the base layer, which is my clay layer and say, well, I don't want it to actually look like clay. I'm going to turn it into, you know, something a little bit more brown and make it look more like leather and click apply. And if I hold down my shift key and my left mouse button, I can sort of change the lighting in the scene. And then I've got my color variants here and I can play around with the colors of this so that I can sort of even make clay look a little bit more leather like. And you can see that what I've got is a layer selected, but on the right side, if I select the mask that's associated with it, it actually shows me uh, where uh, in the layer stack, I've got edge dirt, base mask. And this is a really good way to learn how Mixer is working. Uh, and it's incredibly powerful and it's beautifully procedural and also non-destructive. So I can go in here and modify, uh, for instance, the levels you know, of how these color variants are working as well as the normal details. Uh, so I can go in here and change the way the scratches are actually uh, the range of the scratches. And you can sort of see it update in real time. And if you're not sure what layer you're working on, you just toggle the visibility and sort of see which one is manipulating which. So you can see that the dirt layer is really doing a tremendous amount. So I can select the dirt mask. And I can say, well, what's the grunge. Well, there's the grunge and I can open up the grunge and say, well, what happens if I change the range of the grunge? And you can see that, you know, it starts to manipulate the actual range of the grunge. So by the time you go in here and really work with a smart material, you can actually come up to the very top and say, I'm going to use an add ID mask to it. And when you add ID mask, you say, well, which one do you want to use from the one you imported? And I can say the blue one. And now it's applied it just to the back and the seat, leaving uh, the armrest and the feet available for another material. So now I can go in and say, I want another smart material. And I don't want to go and download. So I'm just going to use Walnut. And it brings in a Walnut material and it tries initially to put it on top of the whole thing. 
So it's thinking for a minute. And so once again, I'm going to apply the material ID on top of it. And I'm going to give it the red one. And you can see it applies the material ID. And one of the cool things that I can do is if I select the base layer, I can come down to the placement of it and I can rotate At this point, by the way, I've got a couple of different versions of Unreal Engine with heavy scenes <laughs> loaded in it and Mixer, and my computer's starting to cry. So uh, you can see I can rotate the wood here uh, as well as change the scale. So this gives me what I want. Maybe I should close this scene in the background. But you can see that, um, you know, very quickly you can get what you want. And I think I got too many channels working here because it seemed to be applying it too much. But this is a very fast way to take an asset, bringing it into Mixer uh, and modify it and... Once you're done, let me show you how you finish this process. You get these materials. You can, of course, build your own versions of a smart material. You can you know, do all this work, and then you can build a group out of it, and you can right-click and say, export this as your own smart material. So it's really, you can see export as smart material. Start building your own tools inside of Mixer, which is really, really powerful and very helpful if you, you know, start to build up your own library of dirts and normals and grunges and cavity maps and, and all different types of things of this nature. Once you're done and you like what you've got, you come into the export settings. Uh, you tell it where you want it to go. Uh, you give it a surface name. You tell it what maps to export, albedo, diffuse, specular, gloss, roughness, normal. And you say export the maps. And... In this case, what I've got here is my material, and it exported for me my albedo, my normal, and my roughness maps, and I was able to very quickly use those to generate a completely new surface for our chair. So for those of you looking at this content saying, I could use it if it had a whole different surface on it, here is a really fine way to go about uh, resurfacing a lot of this great content. So hopefully that was helpful. I'm going to close Mixer and maybe my versions of the engine and give the stream over to Tom and maybe we can answer some questions near the end. Um, sound good? Adara, that Mixer thing is just so cool. It's really just like, it's the last little thing that you need really because for all of this this content um because that looks great and it fits right in with the other chairs and you know you spent a couple minutes on that yeah it was Imagine nothing if, you know if you had a four hour budget to spend retexturing this chair you could get it to fit right in and get the little rivets in there oh and, yeah you know make I, it look like it came from the same store i could mask out the buttons i mean it's just a you know the whole lighting process and resurfacing of those things um, you know, if, if I actually was in production, uh, I would really spend time crafting that stuff. But if, if we're just doing it for, you know, a live stream demo, it, it, look how far you can get, how quickly you can get there. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. That's really, really cool and really demonstrates. And that's, that's the sort of skill that we're talking about. Like if you can, if you're a student, you can go into a studio and perform this sort of work and do it at a high enough quality that you can't tell that that chair came from Edith Finch, then you've just saved the studio the cost of modeling and building an entire chair. You're, you're hired, good to go. Uh, so this is that all of these tools, and I'm gonna show you some stuff in Unreal 2, 2 that helps with this. And um, when we're building these sorts of tools in like Quixel and the tools that are in 
unreal. This is often kind of our thought process is like, you know, we're, we're looking at workflow, like, oh, I've got this chair and it needs this thing done and it needs a thing. How can we optimize that workflow and fill in those gaps so that you don't have to go remodel it or you don't have to go export out materials into Photoshop and try and figure out how to modify the specularity, et cetera. It's so much easier to bring it into Mixer and do it live. Um, so those are the sorts of things that we're looking at. And we often get the question of like, how good will the modeling tools be? And what, why are you doing these things? And so often this is why we're doing it because we use this stuff every day and we're like, oh, I'm so tired of having to go out, bring it into Maya, do a thing, go back into here, bring it like that context switching isn't fun. It introduces errors um, and it, it just makes it harder to work and harder to teach and learn. So we're just building more and more tools and uh, you know, I'm going to show you some stuff that you can do too. So you don't even have to go out to Maximaya uh, because now we have modeling tools in the engine. So uh, why don't I get started here? I might as well just start sharing some screen. If I can remember how to use screen share. Here we go. It's, it's Let me pull this out of the way. One. All right, cool. And close it so I get memory back. There we go. Can everyone see my share here now they see Hopefully. it see let me close the twitch window so i stop distracting myself with the me of six seconds ago <laughs> so um i have a similar room here i also took the the rendering room i did not make it wider like lewis because lewis is a cheater <laughs> and he gave himself a bigger room to work with <laughs> I didn't know that was on the table. Um, so, you know, my background is a tech artist and I've really focused a lot on, on lighting and materials, um, specifically performance and workflow stuff. Um, and so my scene setup's probably not as neat as, as Lewis's. I, I, I like to say that this is just a representation of my mind right now. I just imagine myself like sitting in this chair, listening to music, drinking and taking medications, wishing something would call and that I could go to the outside world. Uh, but maybe that's just reading too much into this weird scene that I made. Um, so, I, and I really just made this scene to, to look at some other things. So before the pandemic hit, I was lucky enough to sneak over to the IT lab and be like, do you have any laptops with a ray tracing card in them? And they gave me one. So I've got a laptop with a 2080 Max Q in it. And so with 426, there's a bunch of new stuff in there. And I love, like I said, I love poking at all the buttons. So I was like, ooh, I'm going to try out 426 and try out some of the tracing stuff. Specifically, I really wanted to try out GPU light mass uh, because I've been using light mass for a long time. And boy, would I like it to be a little better. And I've been playing with it and it's really cool. It's not all the way there, but it really shows like, you know, you saw kind of Lewis's workflow and already that's a million times better than it used to be. Your minds are about to be blown. Um, it's not quite production ready yet. There are some real hard edges to it, um, but you can definitely see that this is going to be a really big improvement. So. Let me go all the way back to ray tracing. So to do this, you have to have right now to use GPU light mass, you have to have an NVIDIA RTX card. Uh, that's all we're supporting right now. It uses generic ray tracing uh, DX12 stuff. So when other graphics cards have support for that, it should hook in and work. We're not like you know, locking it down. It's just that we need that ray tracing hardware to accelerate this stuff and make it happen fast enough to be. Um, and so you have to enable ray tracing. So you have to have a graphics card that can do ray tracing, your latest drivers. And I've got 426. Um, uh, I actually had to back off from the latest preview release because it broke GPU light mass. Let that be a lesson, kids. Don't do production in the preview version because it's going to break, uh, usually the day before the live stream. So, um, so I'm in 426 preview six, and it's working pretty good here. 
so yeah, you have to turn that on uh, and you have to go into your project settings and follow all the things that you had to do to enable ray tracing in general. So you've got to turn on your ray tracing, turn on ray tracing here. The other thing you have to do is set your default RHI uh, right here default RHI to DX12. Um, so that those two things will turn on ray tracing. Ray trace in the viewport and do cool stuff. You need another thing that's a new feature, fairly new, and it's called virtual texturing. And you have to turn on virtual texture support and virtual texture light map. Virtual texture light maps, yes. Uh, you need both of those on because it records your light maps to virtual textures. And virtual textures are just, think of them as like unlimited size textures that the computer breaks up into little normal size textures dynamically um, based on your view. And, and when I do this, you'll actually be able to see kind of where they are. It's pretty cool. Um, and so we can kind of coat the whole scene in one giant texture. And this gives us some really cool powers for baking, helps get rid of seams and all sorts of cool stuff. So, so we've kind of needed a bunch of technologies to come together to make this work like it does. And it's finally there and previewed, or I think it's only experimental in 426. So it's kind of the first, first version, but uh, it really, really is super cool. So. Um, I think that's all you have to set up, if I remember correctly. Now, the scene that I've got here is in unlit. And uh, right now, all it's got is just static meshes. Uh, oh, I'll get rid of the height fog, too. Just get rid of anything that could be a lighting thing. You, when you come in here, and everything is static except for this chair. This chair is dynamic, and it's got physics, so we can push it around and stuff. I wanted to give myself a tech art challenge. It's one thing to light a room. It's another to be able to light a room and have a dynamic object that fits within that. So I, I wanted to see if I could do that. You can have a lot of problems with this scene because you've got the violin on the floor and the record player and the wine is behind there. That's not going to work You can out. see in my broken cup back there. You're, what are you hiding in here? Would you want to know what pills are behind the, the desk, don't you? What I really want to know is what I'm hiding behind this door. <laughs> this is all. <laughs> it's all my secrets. So, I told you it was a metaphor for my mind. This uh, is a very dangerous place. <laughs> <laughs> that this would all be acid jazz. Ah! Uh, all right. So, yeah. So, I, I wanted to give myself a bit of a challenge, what I do to myself. Uh, because it's one thing, like I said, if the system works to build static lighting, that's great. But in a game, stuff moves. So let's let's have something. All right, so this is how the scene comes in and it's in unlit. And if I go to lit, you'll see the only thing that's lit up right now are these little uh, hanging lights that are stuck out here. But there are no lights, there's no lighting. Uh, so, and this is, uh, and, and, and ray tracing is just set up by default. And a bunch of stuff is turned on, you'll see. Um, and we'll kind of want to back it off. So I'm going to start by building just a basic uh, lighting scene. And here we will start with, as you might often, a directional light. Oh, there's our light. And there we go. We can move it around. Something that you'll notice right away, though, is right away uh, you'll notice like some noise up in the shadows. And that's because we're using ray traced shadows on these lights right out of the box. So when you turn on ray tracing and you drop a light in, it wants to use ray trace shadows for better or worse. Ray trace shadows are super accurate um, and sometimes they're faster than regular dynamic shadows. Um, and they also do some cool stuff like lights in real life, if, if an object is further away uh, from the surface it's casting its shadow on, the, the shadow gets more diffuse and you can see that here. And we can actually pump that up in real time and actually see that happen. This is, you know, immediately this is cool because this is something that we used to have to wait for our lighting bakes to see how our soft dynamic light would work. And now I can just see it right in here. As I move the light around, you can see that we're getting these really pretty, pretty impressive shadows uh, running at real time. There's that contact hardening I'm talking about. 
but as things get further away, they, they get blurrier. All right, so we got our light in. Now let's add in the next thing that we need, which is our skylight. Kind of typically how I, I build some things. Oh wait, actually I'm gonna skip the skylight. First, I'm gonna put in some fog so that the skylight has some light to work with. So I will go to visual effects and we're gonna, oh, I'll use the sky atmosphere. There's light, go ahead and 426, by the way, uh, there is now an atmosphere and cloud section for your light. So atmosphere sunlight now lives down here rather than hiding in the advanced section. So that took me a minute to find uh, when I got here, but there's some additional stuff for our volumetric clouds. And so when I do that, the sky updates. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and add in our uh, pipe fog. There we go. Look at that. Just a beautiful day. And then, of course, our skylight. Now the skylight, when I drop it in, it captures the scene, makes an HDRI cube and applies it. But what you might not notice is right away, it's immediately starting to do ray traced ambient occlusion just out of the box. So if you've got ray tracing on and you drag lights into your scene, it immediately kind of builds a, a quasi dynamic lighting setup. And what's cool too is in 426, our skylight now has this great option of real-time capture. So previously a skylight, you'd capture it in the editor, and then if you needed to recapture it, you'd call a blueprint thing, and it would hit your game. Um, so now you can just turn this on, and what it does is, so behind the scenes, how the sausage is made, a cube map is really six renders, up, down, left, right, forward, back. Um, and so that's why it's expensive to recapture this because it has to render the scene six times, composite them. And so what real-time capture does is it only updates one direction per frame. Um, so it keeps, so there is still a performance cost, but it's one sixth of the performance cost it was before. So there is a little bit of lag. You'll notice some discontinuous lighting is changing quickly, but it's still way, way better. So we can turn that on. And now I can select my light here and I can, you know, move it around and I can adjust the lighting in the scene using that sky atmosphere um, really, really easily. And the, uh, the reflection capture and everything are updating in real time. So all of the lighting, see the ray trace reflections on the bed of the truck are working here. And this is, you know, content that was never made for ray tracing. It was just made with uh, you know, our material system and because it's physically based and we've worked really hard to make the ray tracing and all of our other systems work together. We work really, really hard to make this happen. You know, we come up with ray tracing and global and all this stuff. And then it takes us a year or two to get it to really work. Um, and that's really where so much of our work is in developing the systems. It's, getting them all to work together so that when you author a material for this lighting system that works in this lighting system, they all work together and you can just pick and choose. And, and that'll, that'll actually be a selling point. So right now, you know, I've got the scene and it's actually not running too bad, running at 60 frames a second. Uh, oh, let me select my light here and we'll switch that to full so we can put it stuff. There we go. So yeah, we're now rendering, you know, a fully uh, ray traced scene um, at 60 frames a second. This monitor is only 1080p, but not bad. Well, let's, you know, let's take a look at the performance control shift comma brings up our GPU profiler. Sometimes it doesn't when I'm screen sharing or it crashes. Drum roll. Ah, there it is. Came over here. So uh, this is our GPU profiler. It's a quick way of seeing just like where your rendering time is going. Uh, and you can see really quickly that Diffuse uh, Direct and AO is only two milliseconds. So all of this ambient occlusion and direct lighting, not a lot of time. Uh, the lights are taking a good amount of time, but that includes doing their shadows. 
But then here, ray trace reflections is really big. This is taking up 6.48 milliseconds. So uh, ray tracing isn't like a killer. It can quickly become a killer, but you can start using it right now and, and, and you get pretty good results. Uh, but you know, this is all real time and we're not getting bounce lighting. So let's take a look at kind of controlling that real quick, just to see, like, is it feasible? Um, so I'm gonna drop in a post-process volume because oddly enough, post-process volume is where we control all of our ray tracing stuff. So if you drop that in and first thing we're gonna do up, ooh, let's go and make it unbounded. Uh, you'll see that there's ray tracing in here. And if you just search for array, you'll find all the ray tracing things. So you can see in here, we can do stuff like we can disable ray traced ambient occlusion. So real quickly, it defaults to on. And if you don't want it, you can turn it off. Uh, and you can just see kind of what the results are. You can see much better ambient occlusion in areas. It's, and it's not screen space. So, you know, if uh, stuff goes off screen, it stays stable, which is really good. So ray traced ambient occlusion is certainly something that you can decide to use as a replacement for screen space ambient occlusion on high-end hardware. And the performance is certainly higher than screen space, but the quality difference is really significant. Uh, so it's, it's one of those ray tracing effects. I'm like, hmm, consider this. And also if uh, you know, your game has ray traced ambient occlusion, the fallback to screen space isn't so jarring that you can't ship to non uh, ambient occlusion sorts of uh, platforms. And you can really see it like down in these props over here, back side of the, just makes a huge difference. Uh, we can turn on ray trace global illumination. And you will see right away our frame rate gets much, much lower. Um, and you might notice that it doesn't do a whole lot. I kind of have to go pump it up here. I'm going to go find the light, directional light, and light. Now we can see more bounce coming off that, that light. Oh, it's got no direct light coming in. Let's change that. So you can see as I move the light around, we're getting this additional bounce light. Colors are changing based on its angle. All, all, all pretty good stuff, but it doesn't look great. It's swimmy, and as you move the camera around, it has to rebuild itself, and the performance is uh, ungood. And now our frame is at 25. Uh, you know, milliseconds, which if we're shooting for a 30 frames per second game, it's in our, our frame rate there, but certainly not kind of typically where we'd want to be with performance or quality. So ray trace global illumination at real time. Uh, ah, if you're really good and you build your scene really well for it and your targets are really made right, maybe, but it's, it's really couple questions are coming in. Uh, do you want to take a yeah. minute for them? So sure. there's a question me, about, uh, question. so in your skylight, if you uncheck uh, the, uh, the real-time capture, does it uh, stop and go back to um, the calculating the skylight? I mean, the, um, the cube map? Yeah, yeah just, so if just you uncheck back. that, it will just take a single capture. Uh, and so now if, let me get something really shiny. In my cursor. Take me my cursor. Freaking out here, huh? Where is that color tester? Static mesh, there we are. Or something with a reflection on it. Oh, and I have ray traced reflections on, so you couldn't tell anyway. Uh, let's go back to here, details. Uh, so yeah, so let's see. Uh,
So yes, if this is so, oh, this is an easier way to do it. So I can spec, so this is no skylighting. I just turned off the skylight, basically turned it black. And then if you go to capture scene, you can, there's a button down here somewhere, recapture. But typically before, if you made major changes to your scene lighting, like that, uh, this wouldn't recapture automatically. You'd have to hit recapture. You could see the lighting change slightly. Um, and so if you turn all the way back up here, if you turn that on, it'll continuously recapture. If you turn it off, I believe it'll just take whatever that last capture was and use that um, and, and store that uh, as, a, as a key. Well, then there was another question about uh, if you're using these ray tracing features, is there any way currently to bake them out uh, and then send them off to a non-ray tracing computer? Well, let's do that. So that's that's where I was going with this. Dang it. So, you know, it's really cool that we get all this real time. It looks neat and, you know, I'm using my fancy, fancy card. But yeah, it's it's not really performant. You couldn't really ship a game like this. And the only people who could run it have a GTX card and they run it at 30 frames a second. You're not you're not setting the world on fire with that game. Um, so let's take a look at what we can do somewhere in between. So like I said, we work really hard to get all these systems to work together. Uh, so you can just pick and choose what you need for your purposes. And uh, typically speaking, like Lewis showed, you can use light mass to bake lighting into textures. Um, and it works, but it doesn't, it's not one-to-one -one with these ray tracing things because it's using a different lighting path. And if you go this way and you press bake, you're going to end up with kind of different stuff. So we've got this new GPU light mass. And so what GPU light mass is doing is just running this renderer, uh, essentially, but recording the results to textures like you would with, with light mass. So, you know, the scene is set up very much like light mass where you've got, uh, if we go to optimization view modes, we've got light map UVs and they're set fairly high because I want a nice quality in here, but they're not like oh, way over the top, I don't think. Uh, pretty good, but not super crazy. Uh, and this chair is like that because it's dynamic and won't take light map lighting information. So yeah, uh, you know, not, not super over the top and certainly outside I have less because the idea is that you don't actually go out. Uh, it's like the real world. Uh, so yeah, so you still have to have your second UV channels, all that sort of stuff. But what you do to bake your lighting now um, is instead of hitting build, you go and you, of course, turn this on as a plugin. It's called GPU Light Mass. GPU, light, there it is, there's a space apparently, and you enable that. And of course you restart and compile all your shaders again, which is why we're not doing that live. And now you can bake using GI and it shows up right here. So under build, you now have GPU light map. This comes up. So before I run this, what I'm actually gonna do is turn off a bunch of the GPU stuff uh, or the ray tracing stuff, because what I discovered is you end up with two. <laughs> It'll continue ray tracing while it's got ray traced baked stuff. So what I figured out is it's a good idea to go into your post process and just kind of turn off a bunch of the ray trace. Stuff. We'll turn off ray trace ambient occlusion. See what a difference that makes. We'll turn off ray traced uh, globalization. That. Turn off ray traced reflections. And uh, oh, you can't see it here. I hate that. And translucency will set to raster as well. So we are now basically not using any ray tracing in our scene at all. Uh, and now our scene, you know, runs at 60 frames a second. Just to give you an idea, the scene now takes 5.83 milliseconds to render, whereas before it was almost 30 milliseconds to render. So Ray tracing is really heavy. Uh, it's, you know, the hardware and the tech is there to do it, but you really have to 
it's it's not an easy just like hey everything's ray traced uh, and you're still performant. So let's see here. So let's uh, let's bring that Baker back up here. And let's see what this does. But it's helpful to tell everyone that you are running on a laptop. I am. This is an MSI GS65 Stealth 95G. So it's not a crappy laptop, but it's not like an $8,000 workstation. And, you know, this Black Friday, I'm seeing 2000 series laptops for under $1,000. I saw a really nice one at Best Buy. It was 800 bucks. I was tempted. I don't need it. <laughs> I was like, that's a 2080 laptop for 800 bucks. You know, it only has a 1080p screen. You know, there's some, some drawbacks there, but I run 1080p screens. Uh, I don't have the performance for 4K. I like frame rates. Um, so this is the, the GPU light mass window. And you can, of course, like dock this somewhere. I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to leave it floating for, for our session here. Um, and it's got some options here. You can bake what you see, do a full bake, um, and some other quality stuff. And in fact, uh, for now, I'm just going to default so that we can see kind of how it looks out of the box. Um, I'm going to leave those where it is. And so when I hit this button, it's going to start using the GPU to bake. Check this out. It does it live in the viewport. And those are our progress bars. <laughs> so you can see these are the virtual textures um, and they're baking. And for whatever reason, I'm not getting any, uh, any lighting here. I have to do an investigation. Um, and you can see that it's, it's trucking along. Oh, wait, here we go. Oh, uh, still unlit only. This isn't quite what I want. Not very good for me. All right, hang with me here. And so you can see, and it what it does is it prioritizes whatever's in your view. So I do think that I may have messed up my sky. Oh, of course, both my lights are movable. There's nothing for it to bake. <laughs> and even what we're seeing here is screen space can be an occlusion. Also. Aha, uh -huh. so I just, I baked nothing into all the textures. That's thank you, everybody. Very well thank done. You thank you. It, and it's not like it's never happened to me right before. So I'm going to go ahead and switch my lights here to static lights. And like there it is. Make that static. Oh, there we go. Now I'm going to build light. Oh, there we go. Lasanas. <clears throat> now you can see we're getting all of that. And you can see it says slow mode. If we turn off real time, watch how fast it goes. Boop, 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 boop. That's because now it's not competing for the GPU space. Uh, so now when I turn real time back on, uh, I can move around the scene. And like here, if I turn real time back off, it'll truck through it a little faster and I can turn real time back on to take a preview. I can also, you know, turn off the preview bars, uh, et cetera. Let's move this just kind of over. I want to show you real quick what's really amazing is the quality. So let me turn off Fox. It's not it. Whoa. Let's turn on lighting. Look at how clean that is. That's ridiculous. So I've got some, you know, errors over here, but this is low quality. And it happened mm -hmm. while I was watching it. Um, and let's check this out. If I take my light here, and I'm like, eh, I don't like the way it's coming in. While I'm baking, I can just move it. And just see what I'm going to get. Oh, no. I'm going to have to try this unreal thing. These guys know what they're doing. Mm. So you can really see, you know, even though you're not getting a final image right away, it's pretty quick to be able to see what your lighting will do and how it will look 
baked in. Um, and this, you know, this helps with that iterative process um, of trying to figure out, oh yeah. One. So obviously uh, setting the, the skylight to real-time capture when it's static doesn't do capture. So yeah, and then uh, you can just let it truck along. And at any point, once it's actually done, and you can tell it's done because it'll go from this like noisy pattern to a smooth pattern here. Um, and that's it running the denoise pass. So this is one of the key reasons why you need a, one of these GPUs is to run the AI accelerated denoising. So um, basically, you know, we're going from a noisy mess to this beautifully smooth GI using AI. Magic. Thanks, it's AI. magic. It is. And then I can hit save. Um, and then I can hit stop. And what it'll do actually is you'll see, you'll get like half broken <laughs> lighting, yeah. but it's really handy if you're just like, all right, <laughs> look, I've got the old lighting over here, and new lighting over here. Uh, and that's, it'll actually save to your level. Um, so yeah, you can just, it's so, so nice to be able to very quickly iterate on, on your light at the look you want. And then there's, you know, if you want to improve quality, there's a couple switches here. You know, you can pump this up. I found that even like 2048, 256 here. If I run this um, and I do full bake, which is also pretty interesting, full bake bakes the whole scene, but it still prioritizes what's in view because we know that you probably want to see how your lighting looks right away. So it's still baking the entire scene, but it's going to focus on whatever you're looking at. So if I look over here, it'll start spending a little more time over here. It's not as quite as reactive. But again, if I switch off of real time, you'll see the speed go up pretty soon. Of course, increase the quality. Uh, so I won't, I won't sit through all of that. That'll take a while. But yeah, and at any time, I can just turn off real time and start moving through my scene. And it'll keep calculating, just not quite as fast. Here. Oh, I moved something. So yeah, this is this is really cool stuff, and this is obviously where light mass is going to go, and how we're you know improving that iterative process. Now it's not quite there yet. There are some some hard hard issues. Like right now, it doesn't support mass translucency. It's weird. It's the shadows that it casts support them but it doesn't render them correctly. You know, it's in preview, experimental, so I'm willing to accept some of this stuff. Uh, I, would, I would probably just have the art team go and cut these out and make geometry. It's so good. No, probably not. Uh, but, you know, so foliage right now and some other stuff isn't quite working, but I've submitted bug reports to the teams, et cetera. You should as well. That's why we put stuff out in preview so that we can test it against the real world. All right, so I'm going to stop this and go back to bake what you see. And let's do something a little more interesting. Um, so there's a, right. a question gonna... about the actual oh, yeah. uh, usage, you know, so in in a world where there's both pre-computer light maps, I mean, the uh, light mass and uh, GPU light mass, do you have a sense yet of, of why you would use one or the other? So right now you'd probably use CPU light mass because it works more. Uh, it's, but the quality is going to be lower. It's going to be a little slower, obviously. Um, CPU light mass can be distributed. So if you have a render farm, you can distribute it. GPU light mass, you can't. You're stuck with whatever GPU is on your system. Um, which for better or worse. Uh, and, you know, obviously right now it's experimental. So there's rough edges, stuff that it doesn't support, stuff that might be a little buggy. So if you're doing purely environment art and you're looking for the best quality and you're willing to work with some of those edge cases, it's a good choice right now. It's still experimental. So it's, it's something that, 
you know, I've started looking at a lot of this experimental and uh, up and coming stuff in Unreal because I'm looking at what the foundations of the next gen will be. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to learn this stuff now because, you know, one day fairly soon, we won't have all these rough edges in GPU light mass. And I'll really need to understand how to, how to get the most out of it and how to use it. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, if, if I were like starting an actual production game today and I had a two year development cycle, I'd use CPU light mass. I wouldn't ever start a, pro a real project with experimental, but as a student or trying to, you know, develop interesting, engaging curriculum or tasks for your class to do. These are the sorts of things that they can start to experiment with. And for us, it's important, like I said, because you experiment with them and you like them or you don't like them, you can give us feedback and we can. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's GPU light mass and it's, it's, it's really cool. And there's a lot to play with. I want to open up one of the scenes that I did with it. Uh, this one, a night scene. I wanted to do a night scene. Oh, my exposure. And I locked my exposure in too. But this is, so this scene um, is a hybrid. So I've got ray traced reflections on. I've got screen space ambient occlusion rather than the ray trace ambient occlusion. Um, and the lighting is baked. Um, so it's using some dynamicism, some baked. Uh, and then it's using a lot of post-processing to get to its final. Um, but I really just wanted to show you. So this one, I cranked all the settings and let it run. It took 20 minutes to bake this lighting. 20 on one laptop. And, and it's ridiculously good lighting. Um, I mean, each one of these little things has a little contact shadow on it. You can see the, the lighting from, you know, the every little piece, the little bounce lighting. Um, and if you've worked with CPU light mass, you know getting a clean result like this is frustratingly difficult, uh, much less when you start dealing with these really soft, blurry shadows. And this, this wall I set up here, this is my hell wall. This is what CPU light mass can't do. It cannot do thin things sticking on a wall and give you a nice contact. It'll, you'll get a blob or it'll just float. Um, so these are the sorts of things that CPU light mass just doesn't do well at because it's, you should know, it's not a ray tracer, it's a radiosity renderer. Whereas the GPU light mass is a ray tracer. So we're getting ray trace quality shadows and ambient occlusion. So even stuff like these little envelopes here, even though they're super thin and super close to the ground, they're still casting shadows and giving us that depth uh, to the lighting that CPU light mass just doesn't have. So if you can deal with these edge cases and the problems with it, uh, use it now. It, it looks gorgeous. Um, and here is a demonstration of that, that mixed ray tracing. So the only ray tracing I have turned on is the, uh, the reflections. So that when you look out the window, you can see uh, reflections of the inside. That's sides. amazing. The reflections of those. And actually, I think outside looks even more amazing. Even though you're not supposed to go out there, um, this reflection on this glass just looks it's just so square amazing. mask. And when you move, it parallaxes correctly, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and you can see, you know, and my, my frame rate isn't super great when I like look through the window. And I cover the screen <laughs> in in uh, in rendering, but anywhere else in a kind of realistic sort of view, like this is so cool that the the reflection on the sphere is the room, and it's not some weird parallaxy thing. Um, I don't even know. I do have reflection captures in here. Um, I did find that they have some effect on like translucent lighting and some other things, so I still put them in there. But I didn't like. I didn't have to go crazy and like line them all up. It was really just like, oh, that looks better. <laughs> Ray tracing handles the rest. Uh, so yeah, it's, this, this is something I'm really excited about. And I, I was really happy with the quality I got here because I was able to iterate really quickly and just move my, my big 
weird lights around that, like I said, this is something that's new for me. I'm not used to lighting like this. So the ability to um, you know, turn this on, go yeah. see. And even with these super pumped up settings, you still get a preview right away. Um, and the viewport still stays pretty darn usable. I can come out here and grab say big soft warm light that I'm using to see all this this kind of odd bounce of warmth here. Uh, and I can go and see well, what if I move that down here and I put it up on the ceiling. Oh, what if I come over here and just really quickly, even at this you know really high setting, I can see how it looks. And so you know I wanted it to be. I wanted this blue patch from this light, but I wanted it to fade off into warmth and have this warm to blue contrast. Cause I was like, that's impossible. Well, since I could see it live and I could just line it right up. Oh, there it is. Those look, those, the shadows are meeting right up with each other, right where I wanted them to. That's just something that if you had to do with like baking and placing and baking and placing. So it's not even that, um, you know, this this makes your lighting look better, and it does, is that because it takes away iteration time, you can spend more time lighting, and you can be more creative and more intuitive with your lighting and get to what's in your head without having, I we've all done it, where we're like, yes, this is the way my lighting will be, and you bake it, and it's not, and you're like, well, I don't have time to fix that, so uh, it's just not going to have that blue patch. Uh, this is this is so cool to be. So I know we're we're running pretty long here. So uh, I've got you know I could go on. I've, I've built some tools and uh, you know this content is just so much fun to play with. You know honestly, for me as a tech artist, my favorite part of my job is working with amazing artists and taking their content and doing amazing things with it. And so when I get access to these packs like this. I just kind of go to town because it's just a ton of like really high quality resources that I can use to try out uh, these things and to validate. Like if I had to do this scene with my art, eh, I wouldn't know if it really looked good or not. <laughs> but if I can fill the scene with amazing art and put lighting in and it, oh, it, yeah, yeah, I've proved it. And I didn't have to come up with this floral wallpaper pattern. Right? is really nice <laughs> that's fantastic so um maybe we just need to do another stream like this mm -hmm. yeah it's fun i like i like having an assignment mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was like i was back at school uh you know something very focused and like you know i gave myself a couple of constraints and spent the time to learn the stuff and that was really really awesome uh, there was a question about uh, what do you do with your dynamic uh, uh, actors and your characters in this type of lighting environment? That's a, that's a great question. Here, let me uh, let me real quick. So I think I got this one set up. Let me see if I got this. Uh, unfortunately, so just like regular light mass, you know, you've got a couple of options. So if you're using Ray traced ambient occlusion. Um, you're gonna dynamic objects just look pretty good in general. Um, so. um, stuff looks well. This one doesn't. I don't know what's going on there. You know, stuff looks pretty good with the. Uh, oh, I don't. I didn't put in a reflection capture in this map. Sure, though. This is not the map where I've got the. I've made a few maps today. Uh, so it's it's very much, you know, you you still have to have that balance of uh, stationary lights um, and the stationary lights. Uh, oh, that stinks. Oh, I know what I did. I. I, I Broke the night. It's just super quick. Low directional light. Oh, it's my spotlight. 
Oh, good. My spotlight is set up. So this spotlight, which is this blue light that's coming in here, I have set as a stationary light. Um, and sorry, we're getting some weird glowing here. This happens sometimes with ray tracing, where I have to open the map twice. Ah, there we go. Something about that ray tracing gets bugged out. So yeah, if I uh, if I go ahead and let's uh, let's go ahead and just drag. So here's our dynamic chair. And so what's happening here is, you know, we've got our stationary light. Um, the chair is being lit by the uh, volumetric light map that's generated. Uh, that's generated by the uh, uh, GPU light maps, just like light mass does. So it contains all the, the baked lighting in a 3D texture. So it's being lit by that as well as the direct light from the uh, from the spotlight set to stationary. Uh, but you will see that it's using regular regular shadows, so that you know it's got kind of all the problems that regular shadows do with like gaps because of you know. And as we get further away, the the cascaded shadow map loses resolution, etc. Um, and so what we're seeing here is, you know, everything's ray traced, but this light is using kind of traditional, it's just like a regular stationary light in Unreal. Um, but like I said, we work really hard to make all the lighting channels mm -hmm. and everything work together. Um, and so I'm also using screen space ambient occlusion. Uh, so that helps ground the dynamic up. And then if you want to go totally crazy, you can go to your spotlight and you can come down and you can turn on ray trace shadows from it as well, which is not the most performant, but now you get those perfect ray trace shadows with that contact hardening and all of that as well. Um, so so you, you can just kind of pick and choose depending on your scene's need and your performance levels. Let's just, uh, like I said, I wanted to see if I could break it. And it, you know, really the only thing that I found with the, the things, the limitations I found with GPU light mass are uh, masked materials aren't working right now. They obviously will. Uh, and uh, lights, the attenuation radius is not respected. So if you've got an attenuation radius, they all act completely physically accurate. Uh, and you can't turn off uh, inverse square fall off. Um, I don't know if those will get fixed, but I've you know thrown them to the rendering team. Uh, so there's there's a couple of trade-offs there, but yeah, uh, you can just really use it uh, like you do, and you even get those really soft shadows. I will say also, if you want soft shadows when you're using a stationary light, you need to turn on this option. Area. Use area shadows for stationary light. Otherwise, you get uh, the wrong. Uh, you get those hard stationary, those Ooh, crisp stationary right. shadows. So if you want those soft shadows, yeah. Fantastic. Well, we could keep doing this, but I don't know that it's going to make our um, evergreen YouTube video very uh, appreciated by, <laughs> by the community. <laughs> Uh, make Victor suffer. Make him watch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That was great. I think uh, we can save some of the other stuff that I'd prepared and some of the stuff you prepared for another stream because mm -hmm. it seems like uh, people are enjoying it. We thought we wouldn't have enough to show. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed all of that material. Um, we did want to ask a quick question to... Um, everyone on the stream that is, you know, been watching our Friday streams and that is part of the education community in general. Uh, we are considering probably moving into the beginning of 2021, uh, transferring this Friday stream to Tuesdays. And we wanted to uh, see if anyone who is a regular to our Friday streams uh, would be in any way affected. We'll probably ask this question again uh, next Friday and possibly even put out a survey and get your feedback. But uh, while you're all here uh, and can chat in the chat, just let us know if uh, if Tuesdays are a good day in general for the community that uh, typically tunes in and let us know. 
Uh, but in general, that would give us a, an, an extra day because I know that there are, are quite a few people that tune into this stream that also tune in on the Thursday stream. So that would give a little bit of breathing room, I think, in general uh, for everyone who enjoys the Unreal Engine streams. And um, and I think that that would be, in general, fine. But we wouldn't want to... We know that one of the reasons we picked Fridays is because typically a lot of people in the education community have classes, and, and Fridays tends to be a day when some people don't have classes. But um, I think it'd be good for us, and uh, as long as it's good for everyone who is a regular, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, that it would work out for everyone. So once again... We're not going to do it right away, but we'll uh, probably put together a survey and make sure that it gets sent out to everyone, and um, and we'll see what response we give. What do we have next week? So next is, Friday, is Darryl, yes, friends? next Friday we're going to do a stream yeah. called Understanding the Variant Manager, which is another amazing tool set that is uh, once again being updated into 4.26. Uh, the Variant Manager is a really powerful tool. Um, it was, I think, originally made with uh, kind of the automotive industry in mind and um, and being able to swap things out. But I think it's it's been used and can be used in so many different ways that we wanted to talk about it. Uh, once again, Tom's going to tech art it a little bit. Daryl Obert is uh, someone that I've known for many years uh, who is uh, working with our uh, marketing team who's going to jump in. And he's been working with it quite a bit. Uh, and it's a great tool. So if you want, have a lot of variety you need to get out of uh, an environment even like this where you want to do swaps with the materials or change the light or change, you know, it's it's for helping to change things in the environment without necessarily having to build crazy blueprints to do it. Because, uh, you know, it can do a lot of things of that nature. It's basically a big variable changer that uh, that's built into a tool set. So uh, next Friday's stream is Understanding the Variant Manager. And then... Uh, the following week is uh, Thanksgiving here in North America, so we probably, well, we aren't going to have a stream uh, on Friday, but uh, then we'll be back after that. So um, if there's any final question, please type it into the chat. Uh, we have are now two hours and 40 minutes into this one, and we want to thank you all uh, for hanging out with us. And uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark. And uh, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, this material. Once again, we hope you take full advantage of uh, this content. Uh, it's really amazing. We've really enjoyed working with uh, the Edith Finch content and, and putting this stream together, both from uh, doing the environmental storytelling, talking about lighting, talking about how you can modify this content. Uh, one of the things that Tom wanted to get into, but I don't think we had the time today, was how you can actually opening up the, uh, the modeling tools inside of Unreal Engine and add more geometry to... Uh, some of the things if you wanted to, you know, not have to do that inside of Max or Maya or Blender. Uh, but be aware that that tool set is available. Uh, and um, maybe we'll save that for another upcoming stream in, in December at some point. Awesome. That sounds good. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we take really care. enjoy you all hanging out with us on your Friday. Please take care, be safe, and we will see you next Friday for Understanding the Variant Manager. And that is us for this Friday. You all take care and thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye Louis. Bye, Mark. Good weekend, everyone. Hello.